This morning, uh, for the scripture reading, our pastor will be teaching from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning with verse 25 through 30. 1 Samuel 17, verse 25 through 30. If you're physically able to stand up, would you please, out of respect for the reading of God's word in his church. Verse 25, And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Verse 28, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left with those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou might seest the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. May the reading of God's word touch our heart. May we all be blessed here today and the message to follow. Thank you. You may be seated. The words of that song that Pastor Benjamin sang are, are really something. And you know, when you consider that we're his church and all that he's made us by his grace, surely, hearing those things, we, we ought to feel blessed. But I'll tell you something else that just kind of fills me is, boy, I, we ought to feel responsibility, you know, to, to take that name on ourselves and, and to be the ones that are supposed to represent Christ uh, to the world and stand on his truth. What a responsibility, a weight of responsibility that is. So uh, thank you for the song, but boy, it really makes you, it makes you think and ponder and, and, and certainly through the blessing strive to be all that God has called us to be. This morning in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we come to a very familiar passage of Scripture, uh, probably the most familiar in David's life. I remember when I was uh, growing up and uh, playing baseball with my friends or playing basketball. If ever I came up just short, there was a statement that they would say to me. If I uh, hit the front end of the rim on a free throw, uh, if I hit a warning track fly ball, uh, then we would say to each other, they would say to me, you should have had your Wheaties. You should have ate your Wheaties. And what they meant by that was you needed a little more oomph because Wheaties claim to be the breakfast of champions. Just eat your Wheaties and you'll be a champion, right? Well, uh, a lot of those days I had eaten my Wheaties and it still didn't get me over the top. You know, the reality is what a champion needs more than a good breakfast is a champion needs the right cause, the right reason for going to battle for why he does what he does, what stirs his heart, what causes him to put his all into the fight. I had friends growing up that had much more skill, uh, much more natural talent, if you will, uh, in athletics than someone like my brother. Uh, In fact, a lot of times people would look at some of those friends of mine and uh, they would think, hey, that's the guy I want on my team. But if I was ever to go into the battle, if I was ever to go play basketball, the one that I would pick for my team was my brother. And uh, it wasn't so much that he had uh, greater abilities necessarily. It wasn't that he had uh, greater natural talent. Uh, Certainly being my little brother, it wasn't that he had that in his favor. Uh, But what he had was he had a heart. And he was somebody that was fierce on the battlefield of the basketball court. He was somebody that when he played football, he put his heart into it. He had the heart of a champion. You know, in this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 17, is we see a little bit more about what we talked about last week. 
We saw last week David's heart, the heart of a king, the heart that separated David and, and set him apart. And here this week we find what it is that filled his heart, what it was that was echoing in his heart that made David so unique. And we see it played out on the battlefield with Goliath. David's heart, the heart of a champion. We see this week the champion's cause, and that which had gripped David's heart. Here this morning, I want to speak to you on the champion's cause and understand what ought to grip our hearts as the people of God. What is it that ought to lead us into battle and call us to face the giants of our day? Let's pause for prayer as we consider today the champion's cause. Father, we come to you today. I thank you for the privilege that we have of being together. Lord, in these moments, I pray that you would be glorified. Lord, by our hearts being stirred about the cause for which we labor, the cause for which we run the Christian race, the cause for which we fight the good fight of faith. Lord, all these things that we pray, Lord, that you would do by your grace for your glory. Lord, we know that we need you. I pray for the filling of the Spirit in these moments. Lord, to stir our hearts. Lord, to give me the words to say. Lord, to meet every need that's represented in this auditorium. Father, teach us about the cause of a champion and use these moments for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the previous passage, we saw the Lord chose David to lead his people because of David's heart. David was referred to by Samuel as the man after God's own heart. He was far different from Saul, and the Lord revealed this difference, as we will see in chapter 17. Even back in chapter 16, where we left off last week, as the chapter progressed, the difference between David and Saul would become stark. It was very obvious. David was a man at peace, while Saul was a man very troubled and lacking in peace. And in chapter 17, we have the most famous story involving David, his battle with Goliath. And this morning, we're going to consider the circumstances that led to the showdown. We're not even going to look at David approaching Goliath, the conversation, to him slaying the giant. We're going to save that for a later time, hopefully, Lord willing, next week. But this week, I want us to consider the cause that gripped David's heart, a cause that David was willing to die for. The reality is that all of us here this morning have a cause a cause that we're living for day by day. There is something that you are putting your heart into, something you're striving to obtain. There is, if you will, a, a motto that you're living by. There is something etched in your heart, in your soul, that causes you to do what you do. You have a cause. Sometimes those causes that we live for are insignificant, and yet we expend our lives living for them. Some live to express the glory of their favorite college football team. And on Saturdays, they let it be known who the greatest is. Right? That's their cause. And I've met people who live like that. There's so many insignificant causes. Other causes are more noble. Not necessarily selfish or self-serving, but rather self-sacrificing. David went out to fight Goliath, as we're going to see in 1 Samuel 17, compelled by the highest cause. A cause that gripped his heart. And we see that cause, the reason behind his fearless confrontation of the giant this morning. And we must ask ourselves, what is our cause? What's the reason that you do what you do? What is it that you are living for? What is it that you'd be willing to die for? Well, notice if you would in 1 Samuel 17, the first thing that brought all this about. And that is the crisis, the crisis that faced the nation. In verses 1 and 2 of, of chapter 17, we find the forces of the Philistine army and the forces of Israel coming to meet each other on the battlefield. The Philistines were a perpetual adversary to Israel going back into the time of the judges. They would invade and they would put Israel to tribute. You remember that famous judge Samson and who he was used of God to free Israel from their slavery and, and being under bondage to the Philistines. The Philistines were a, seafar a seafaring people, uh, perhaps known in history as the Phoenicians. By the way, the term Philistine is where we get the term Palestine from. And the Palestinians of today are not Philistines. 
They're not descendants of them. The ones called Palestinians today are Arabs. Uh, Palestine was a name given to the land of Israel by the Romans, and they, it was a derogatory term, and they were kind of rubbing salt in the wounds of the Jews. Uh, you're Palestinians. By the way, even in the early 1900s, Israelis were referred to as Palestinians. Did you know there was a Palestinian orchestra made up entirely of Jews? Palestinian brigades in the British army that were composed of Jews. Uh, it wasn't until the 40s and 50s this new Palestinian term was used, and it's Arabs that had come into the land of Israel, and it's been Israel's land since God gave it to them. And it's always going to be Israel's land. And that's just bonus material for you this morning. But the Philistines came against Israel to fight them and to try to bring them back under their power and back under their authority. Now, the setting for this showdown we read in verses 1 and 2 and 3 is that the armies of the Philistines gathered on one mountain well, the armies of Israel gathered on another mountain. And there was a valley between these two mountains. And so what we have set up is kind of a natural arena. When David goes to fight Goliath, they're going to be in the valley with the armies of either side, both looking down and no doubt cheering on their fighter. The Philistines, no doubt, thinking they're invincible. The Israelis just waiting and expecting the worst. But this is the scene. And we find here the forces gathered. We also notice in this passage the foe. The Philistines had in their army a giant. Their champion, as he is called in verse number four. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Goliath was one of the Anakim. That's a term that today is, has provoked a, a lot of theories about them. The Anakim were giants that inhabited Canaan. Even as Joshua and Caleb brought back that report, you'll remember how the, the, the other ten spies said there's giants in the, land. There, in the land, there's Anakim, we can't go and fight it. They're too powerful, they're too big, they're too mighty. We're in their eyes as grasshoppers. Of course, Joshua and Caleb filled with faith in God. They said, no, we can't take it. They had to wait 40 years to do it. But there, when they entered into the promised land, you'll remember Caleb said, give me the mountain. I want the mountain where the Anakim live. And, and Israel was successful by God's enabling, God's grace. And through that faith, God blessed it. The Anakim were driven out of Israel. But they were not driven out of Gath and Gaza and also Ashdod, according to Joshua 11.22. These were cities occupied by the Philistines. And that's where Goliath came from. Now, there's not complete agreement, as we look at verse number 4, as far as the measurement of a cubit. If, uh, traditionally, a cubit is 18 inches. But a cubit was from the tip of a man's elbow to the top of his middle finger. And, and you can see that's about 18 inches. Some of you have longer arms. It might be a little longer. If it's 18 inches, then Goliath would have stood 9 feet 9 inches tall. Matthew Henry believed he was even taller. In his study, he came to believe he was 11 foot 4 inches tall. Now in this passage, he wasn't just tall, but he was immensely strong. We're told here in verse number five, he had a helmet made of brass on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. We don't use that measurement today. In today's measurements, that coat of armor weighed around 125 pounds. You'll also notice in verse six, he had greaves of brass on his legs, a target of brass between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Again, not terminology we use. That's approximately... 15 pounds was just the tip of his, spear, of his spear. Now, to put that into perspective, when we think of the tip of his spear being 15 pounds, we might say, well, that's not so big. Well, I, I like to point out our baseball players today, Aaron Judge, swings a bat. And, of course, we look at that bat in his hands. How much does that bat weigh? About two pounds. That's how much a, a baseball player's bat is. Imagine a spear being able to be used where just the tip was 15 pounds. And the guy not struggling to throw it, not struggling to, to swing it. What we see in Goliath in, in, um, in modern terms, he was like an Abrams tank on a battlefield filled with uh, World War II era Sherman tanks. 
invincible. I read one commentator who thought all of this armor on Goliath would hinder him in battle. I don't believe so. I believe that Goliath could wear that armor and move freely. I think he was just that massive, just that strong. It's interesting, Steph Curry, an NBA player and somebody who's fit, a champion on the basketball court, is six foot two, and he weighs 190 pounds. If you just add a foot to his stature, we meet a guy named Shaquille O'Neal. I recognize his physique was a little different than Steph Curry's, but you know how much uh, Shaq weighed? At his lowest, he weighed 325 pounds. Just, just one foot of height, and you see how much girth is also added, how much mass comes to a man. From a simple research that I did, a man 10 foot tall would most likely weigh in excess of 1,000 pounds. And that's not him being overweight. That's a healthy, active weight. In other words, if you would have looked at Goliath and David, they would have been in proportion like me and my five-year-old son, JJ. That would have been the proportion in size. So when you talk about a foe, when you talk about a champion, when you talk about a giant, this is the imagery that should come to your mind. This is somebody that, as far as human speaking, you would not want to get in a wrestling match with. This guy could rip your head off. One blow, and he would crush your skull. This man was a giant. He was a monster on the battlefield. You also find in the passage, this giant made a challenge. He tells him in verse number eight, he says, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Why do you set your battle in order? Am not I a Philistine, your servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we, the whole army, will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. He begins to speak these words. Again, somebody that size, his voice alone must have just sounded incredible. Probably eerie and, and, and just unhuman. We have many today as we look at this. And, and something we have to acknowledge is our giants aren't humans today that we face. But we do face giants that are just as powerful. The spiritual giants we face, things like our personal struggle with a besetting sin that beats us down and speaks those words defying us. You'll never get victory over me. And some that are humiliated by that sin again and again. Sometimes that giant is a troubled past. You can't serve God. Look at what you've done. God can't use you. Who do you think you are? And those giants speak and they trouble us and they oppress us with their words and with their thoughts. Sometimes a giant's an emotional battle. A giant's some people's lives of anxiety or worry. A giant's of fear. A giant of anger. You know, other giants that are present today are ones in society. Voices that are large, intimidating, oppressing, threatening, that cause the people of God to run away with their tails between their legs. But one thing is for certain, there are giants. And every giant is a giant by virtue of being far too strong for us. Far too strong for us and our power to have any chance at overcoming. Understand, that's what a giant is. One that could smash us and perhaps has smashed us through the years. We'll see next week how we do battle with a giant. I want to see this week why. Notice in the passage the response here in the crisis that came, and that's because of fear. In verse number 11, when Saul and all the Israel heard, uh, heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Again, verse number 24, it would go on. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. The whole army and Saul, they were paralyzed by fear. Look at that spear. One blow from it would break right through my armor and shield. Look at that armor. Even if I could avoid his spear, I'll never get through that armor. He's impossible. I can't overcome the giant. You know what? Fear in the lives of God's people will never bring victory. If we abide in fear, the giant wins. You'll see in this passage that that fear brought failure. 
In verse number 16, the Bible tells us, The Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. For 40 days, this same scene would play itself out in the morning and in the evening. Israel on one side, the Philistines on the other, the champion, this mass of a human walking down into the valley and defying God and defying Israel and challenging them to send one man to come and fight him. Now, it's interesting that it was 40 days because when you read the number 40 days, there's a few other things that ought to come to your mind. The number 40 in the word of God is a time of testing. How many days was it that Jesus was tested in the wilderness? 40 days he fasted. How many years was it that Israel spent in the wilderness? 40 years the Lord said, I proved you in the wilderness. Again, how many years was Moses a shepherd as he was tested and tried before he even led them? 40. So we see again and again that number 40 represents testing. And so Israel was put to the test for 40 days. And what did the test reveal about Israel? Failure. Fear. Cowardice. Did the nation pass the test? No, not at all. And really it was a circumstance where it came from the top down. Who should have gone and fought Goliath out of Israel? King Saul. Wasn't he Israel's champion? Wasn't he chosen to be king because of his size? Didn't we see last week how he was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel? Wasn't he the one that led them into battle against the Philistines and won repeatedly? It was Saul. Saul was the champion, but Saul wouldn't fight the giant. Why? Well, if we look back in chapter 16, we'll see this. Saul, in verse number 14, had, instead of the Spirit of the Lord upon him, he had an evil spirit, a troubling spirit sent by God, because Saul had been rejected by God. And Saul knew that God wasn't with him. Those words of Samuel probably echoed through his mind. God's rejected you from being king. He's found a man after his own heart that's going to serve him as king. And Saul knew these things and all these things in his mind. Do you think Saul had any confidence whatsoever that if he went down into that valley, that the Lord would be with him and help him to overcome that giant? He had no confidence. In fact, I think Saul probably felt like, I'm going to die. God's not with me. Here he is in this troubled state. And and you know what? Our adversary, the devil, knows when we're in a troubled state. And so when Israel had a leader that was that cowardly, when Israel had a leader that was that far from God, that's when Satan brought the giant. And Israel was unprepared. You know what? Don't abide in a spiritual condition where you're not close to God. Those are the times where Satan's most likely to bring the giant and you will be not ready to face it. We notice in this passage the crisis. We also notice in this passage, though, the champion. We see there was a void of leadership in Israel. There would come a time in Israel's history where the Lord would state that he sought for a man to stand in the gap, and he found none. But on this occasion, God found one. There was a man who would stand in the gap. The soldiers and the king had left a gaping hole. It would be filled by a shepherd boy. Notice the shepherd in this passage is David. We're told in verse number 17, uh, sorry, verse 15, David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. This passage, uh, again, we sometimes picture David. How big would David have been? How old would he have been? He's called a stripling in verse number 56. And that's a Hebrew word, according to R.P. Smith, which would speak of a young man who's fully grown. So he had reached, you know, however high he's going to reach. I've told you in the past, most Grittens are going to grow to be five foot ten. Up until Alex, nobody could break the threshold of six foot, but he rebelled, and he is over six foot tall, all right? But usually, you get to 5'10", you know, that's the cap. That's where you're stopping. Well, David had reached the cap, if you will. 
he was as tall as he was going to be. I wouldn't think he's probably as necessarily as, as broad as he would be. We understand that as a boy goes through those uh, growing uh, times. And, but that's about where he's at. So he could be 16, he could be 18, somewhere in that range. So we'll, we'll say today he was 17 years old. I do know that David was 23 when he became king over Judah. And there's a lot of events and activity that happens between Goliath and him becoming the king. Now, in chapter 16, David had been made Saul's armor bearer. But when the need for the battle arose and Saul went out to battle, we see in verse 15, Saul sent David home. I don't know if Saul looked at him and said, you're too young for the battlefield. I don't know if he looked at him and said, I can't depend on you, the armor bearer, the one that was to protect the king. I don't know if I can depend on somebody so young or what it was that filled Saul's heart. But David was sent back to the sheep. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment, because for David, that would have been a demotion. I mean, when you're a young man, 16 or 17, and the king says, I want you to be my armor bearer. Wow. Especially that early in life. He made me his armor bearer. Boy, what a position. Now, we're not told that David was filled with pride because of it. But again, it's a notable thing, especially for his age. But when the battle came, Saul says, you know, I want somebody more experienced. David, go home. And David went from being in the presence of the king to back to being with sheep. Again, today we glamorize being a shepherd. But in those days, that was the lowest job on the totem pole. David had it because he was the youngest out of all of his brothers. And so he's the little guy. You go watch the sheep. But you know what? David was a faithful shepherd. And in this passage, we find that God used a shepherd rather than a soldier. God used a, uh, God used a youth rather than a grown man. Because when a soldier won't stand up, God will find somebody who will. When the grown man won't stand up, God will find somebody who he can use. And here he says there's a shepherd who's got a heart of a champion. I'm going to use him. You also find in this passage, David was not only a shepherd, David was a servant. In verse number 17, his father gave him orders. He said, take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves. Run to the camp to thy brethren. Carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand. Look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Saul, as the king, had looked at David's brothers and he had said, hey, here's some warriors for me. And he took Eliab. You remember when Samuel saw Eliab, he said, surely this is the guy that God wants to be king. Eliab had that physical imposing presence. And Saul said, this guy is not only going to make a good linebacker, this guy's going to make a good soldier. And so he brought him into his army, as well as David's two next in line brothers. Well, Saul, uh, David's father, as a natural father, says, I want to know how your brothers are. How's the battle going? What's going on? Are they okay? So go down there and find out. And, and as you go, take some provision with you. And I don't know if Jesse just saw the provision as a way to find out the status of his sons or if he wanted to bless them. Hey, how about a care package? We like that, right? And so these soldiers, they're there. And, and David, we see, is given these orders. And David is faithful. Here he's just an errand boy. He's just a servant. Do you know who God uses to overcome the giants? It's a servant. Who makes the best soldiers? Servants. I learned this with my son going through the Marine Corps. That when he was there, the first thing that they try to train him, and the main thing they try to teach them when they're in boot camp, is you just simply obey. You're given orders, you do it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to agree with it. When I say march, you march. When I say dig, you dig. When I say fill back in what you just dig, you fill it back in. You just do. You just go. And we know that in our military. If you want to be a good soldier, you first have to be a good servant. And so we find in David a shepherd, a servant, and that's who, da who, that's who God's going to use. Notice in the passage what happens. Because David goes to the army as the Lord told him. And, and the Bible tells us in verse number 22, it says, David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage. He ran into the army, came and saluted his brethren. He found them. 
He's found his big brothers, his older brothers. And I'm sure, again, for David, that's exciting. Uh, Looking up to older brothers, I'm sure, like a a younger brother would do. I don't know how many years separated them. Probably at least a dozen. His older brother, Elia, maybe 29, maybe early 30s. And and so growing up, he was always probably the fun uncle of the group, you know. And and, uh, that's what we see with JJ. He adores his big brothers, and he looks up to them, and they spoil him. Uh, They tell us that he's spoiled, but they're the ones that did it. That's uh, JJ. Well, that's David to his older brothers. He goes to see how they're doing. And while he's there, it says Goliath came. In verse 23, he spake according to the same words, and David heard it. But here's the shock of David. And that is, in verse 24, David watches. What happens when this guy defies God? It says, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. David's there with his brothers, these guys that he's looked up to his whole life. And this giant comes out and defies their army and defies God. And David is appalled when his own brothers run away. Eliab, where'd you go? Shema, where are you? Where's everybody? And not only his brothers, but the champion of Israel. Where's King Saul? What's happened? Again, as a, as a young man, no doubt in his mind, he has such a, a high opinion of his brothers and of the king and of the army. And hey, we're invincible. And the tales of their victories of the past have filled his mind. You know how young men are. But to stand there on the battlefield and to see all this and to see such cowardice. David is shocked. And we find the statement in verse 25, in verse number 26, and and David says, what shall be done? All all these offers by Saul, and and nobody will go and fight him? He says in 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 the verse, verse 26, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is he to defy God? Why are we running from him? What's going on? You know, it's interesting, that statement he made, who is he to defy the armies of the living God? It's almost like for those soldiers in Saul, God was dead. It was like there wasn't a living God. David would say in this chapter, he said to Goliath, he would say, I come to you in the name of the Lord, the living God. I I come to you for the battle is the Lord's. It belongs to him. But the rest of the soldiers and the king, they didn't believe it. But David did. And you know, we look at this story and we we think of David and Goliath and the David and Goliath story. Well, that's the, the story, the underdog wins. When you have in basketball or football, even today, and and the unexpected one, like yesterday, David beat Goliath as Notre Dame fell to Northern Illinois, right? David beat Goliath, the underdog won. Can I tell you in this story, the underdog doesn't win? The underdog was Goliath. Goliath was the one that was poking God. Goliath wasn't just out there defying Israel. He was defying the God of Israel. And David understood that. This was the Lord's battle. Guess what? God's undefeated. Goliath had no chance. David then began doing what was needed in that army and is still what is needed today. Notice what David does in verse 26. David spake to the men, these men that are running. And what does he do? He speaks truth. He speaks truth. You know, there's so many battles, so many giants that we face where the key element that's missing is someone to stand up and speak truth. Even in your own battles, in your own life, if you're battling, you know, whether it's depression or you're battling anger, you're battling pride, whatever it is that you're battling, the key thing that's so often lacking is speaking truth to yourself. These men needed to hear truth. God's alive. God's not dead. This this giant, it's not just about you and him. This is about him and God. And how can we stand there and let this giant stand and blaspheme the name of our God? David here is fired up and he speaks truth. I want to see a third thing. 
and that is the criticism that comes. Verse 28, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride, the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Notice the unexpected source. I'll tell you what, it's typical when you try to do something for God, when you stand up for truth. If you're going to speak truth and try to stir others to action, that you become a target of criticism. And the main thing that the critic will do is they won't so much attack the message as they will the messenger. I know why you're doing this. I know why you're saying this. And so it is with this critic, and that's Eliab. But boy, how, how hard it must have been for David to hear these words, not just from a soldier at large, not just from the king, but his own brother. And of course, it's untrue slander that Eliab speaks. All that he said in verse number 28, it's untrue. He asserted that David had no business being there. He implied that David had been irresponsible with his responsibilities of the sheep. He slighted David's work. Notice he said, with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Just a digging statement. He slighted David as insignificant. He judged David's heart and motives as proud, evil, and immature. And it's telling just how wrong Eliab was when he says in that verse, I know thy heart. Who knows a person's heart? Only God. Eliab was the one in pride. And isn't it also telling that he judged David's heart, the one whose heart God was pleased with? The man after God's heart. You know, it's interesting, criticism directed within the people of God towards other people of God and what it's like. I I remember studying in World War II this fascinating. They, they, They tried out so many new weapons in World War II. One of the weapons they tried out were anti-tank dogs. So what's an anti-tank dog? Well, the Russians tried this. They actually trained dogs to run under tanks. And in training them to run towards tanks, whether it was through treats or whatever it was, as the dogs ran, to the, as they were trained to do so, then what they did was they, they fastened the dog with a landmine. And so the dog would run under the tank and blow up and blow up the tank. That was the weapon, all right? The problem was, when they tried it on the battlefield, sometimes the dogs ran for the wrong tanks. And even worse, with all the commotion of the battlefield, sometimes the dogs came right back to their handlers. No! That's what criticism's like. It's friendly fire. It's blowing up the wrong guys. If Eliab had had his way, that giant would still be standing in the valley today. And Israel would still be a bunch of cowards. There'd be no victory, just perpetual defeat. But notice the unfaithed shepherd. In verse 29, David simply responded with, What have I now done? What is it I'm doing wrong, Eliab? Show me. Is there something I've said that's wrong? Something that I've done that's wrong? Just a simple question. But you know, we we see his response. Charles Spurgeon said this. He says, We've not sufficiently noticed that immediately before the encounter with the Philistine, David fought a battle which cost him far more thought, more prudence, and more patience. The word battle in which he had to engage with his brother and with King Saul was a more trying ordeal to him than going forth in the strength of the Lord to smite the uncircumcised boaster. It was harder, Spurgeon would say, to deal with the criticism for David than it was for him to go and deal with the giant. Probably because it was unexpected. We notice David's second response, and that question leads us into our final thought, and he asks the question, is there not a cause? Let's think about that cause in closing. There in the face of such scathing criticism as a witness to the cowardly actions of his nation's army, David stood with a heart full of faith in the power of Almighty God and with a heart full of love for the Lord that desired to see His name honored and glorified. And from that heart came words that still search our hearts today. Is there not a cause? We see it's a purpose. 
The cause is what David spoke of. Is This cause he spoke of is wrapped up in his purpose for life. This is the why of David's being. Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Is there not a cause? Here you can see him searching and, and just the question to Eliab, shouldn't someone be standing up? Shouldn't someone fight for the honor and glory of the Lord? Shouldn't someone be willing to sacrifice for his name and for the, for the nation? Don't we have a duty? Do not we have a reason to be on this battlefield? Is there not a cause worth dying for? That's the question that he's asking Eliab. Is there not a cause? Have you forgotten your cause? Charles Kahn tells the story of seeing a restaurant listed in the Yellow Pages by the name of Church of God Grill. Out of curiosity, he called the number to find out how the restaurant had obtained such an unusual name. The response, well, we had a little mission down here, and we started selling chicken dinners after church on Sunday to help pay the bills. Well, people liked the chicken, and we did such good business, eventually we cut back on the church service. And after a while, we just closed down the church altogether and kept on serving the chicken dinners. We kept the name that we started with, and that's Church of God Grill. Completely missing why they were there in the first place. The armies of Israel were like that. They forgot why they were there in the first place. Rather than going out to fight, they were playing hide and seek. Rather than warring, they were just watching. They lost their sense of purpose. Have we forgotten the cause? Have we forgotten why we're here? How would you answer that question? What's your purpose? Why are you here? Now there's power when the cause captures your heart. When the cause for Christ gets a hold of you, you won't run from the giants. You'll run to them. The cause was so real to David, he couldn't help but share his burden with those around him. He pursued the battle with the giant when no one else would. It would have been easy to place the responsibility on the battle on the shoulder of the king or of the soldiers, but he was overcome with the necessity of the cause for which he lived. Somebody's got to do something. It's God's glory that's being attacked. His name that's being blasphemed. It's interesting in verse number 25 how the king of Israel had tried to move his army to go and fight. You see the causes that he offered them? Look again what it says. It says the king, it says in the middle of the verse, it shall be the man who kills the giant, the king will enrich him with great riches. Here's a cause a lot of people are living for. Money and wealth. And Saul said, hey guys, whoever kills the giant, you're going to have great wealth. He doesn't even put a dollar figure on it. You're going to be filthy rich. That didn't move anybody. He says, well, let me add to it. Not only am I going to give you possessions, but I'm going to give you position. Whoever goes and fights that giant and kills that giant, I'm going to give him my daughter in marriage. Now that would make them, that would make them part of the king's family. Suddenly, you're nobility. You're not a nobody. You're a noble. You get to eat at the king's table. Wow. Hey, that's a motivation, right? Possessions and position. And still nobody would go and fight. He says, well, then how about your own family? I'll make it so that they're free in Israel. Free from paying taxes free from any sort of servitude that they might be in if they were indentured servants. They'll be free. And even family, that motivator, wasn't enough for these guys to go down there and fight Goliath. And I'm sure the calculation was this. What good's position and possessions if I die? What am I left with? They had a cause that was offered to them that was just temporal. And that's what most people are living for, vain, empty, temporal things. But David had a cause that even if he died for that cause, that cause goes on into eternity. 
You could stand before God having been faithful to the cause that really matters. That was David's heart. That was David's life. You know, that same cause is what we see in the three Hebrew children. That same cause, what we see in Daniel and his willingness to pray day after day. It was the glory of God. That was their cause. You've got to have this cause in your heart. It's the cause that keeps you fighting. It's the cause that keeps you in the race. It's the cause that enables you to endure the criticism of others. It's the cause that enables sacrifice. If you're not living for the right cause, then you'll never succeed in your Christian life. What is your cause? I like the words of the Apostle Paul. He made this statement about his cause. He summed it up in one word. For to me, to live is Christ. That's the cause. The cause is Christ. There's nothing else. Nothing that can take his place. Nothing else that measures up. But don't we see in this passage the strength of David's heart? What was so special about him? He knew Jehovah God. He loved the Lord. He would die for the Lord. And Paul was the same way. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want want the Lord. I want to please the Lord. He talked about in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I've been apprehended. Something has taken hold of me. and, And it's that which I've been apprehended for Christ. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is what I'm after. This is my cause. It's the only cause worth living for. I know this. When I was a lost cause, a guilty, vile, helpless sinner, no better spiritually than Goliath, when I was abiding under the wrath of God due to my sins, Jesus took up the cause of redeeming my life. He came to earth and endured the hatred of men. The vitriol of the forces of evil allowed himself to be nailed to a wooden cross, lifted up in shame, lifted up in agony, becoming sin for me. But then this same Jesus defeated the greatest Goliath. When he rose that third day, sin in the grave is powerless. He rose again and it was all for me. It was all for my part and all for my life. All that I might stand justified, sanctified, and one day glorified. And this same Jesus, my Lord and Savior, gave me a new heart, a new purpose, a new calling, a new home, a new family. All things become new. Shall I not take up his cause? Shall I not take up that cross that he's called me to carry? Can I ignore the battles of my life and of my day? Should I live in fear while his name and his honor and his glory is trampled by the enemies of the cross? Is there no reason for me to live a living sacrifice? Yes, there is a cause. His name's Jesus and for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. I must live for him. I must, if need be, die for him. And every day I must die to self and to the world. I must die to personal ambition and pride, die to the world's lust and its grip, and live and walk in newness of life. This morning, David asked the question, is there not a cause? Christian, we have a cause. Let that cause fill your heart. Let it flow through your thoughts. When you wake in the morning, May the cause of the glory of Christ be the first thing on your mind. When you pillow your head at night, may the cause of the glory of Christ be what you have lived for. And may his glory be what you dream of. Don't let the giants in your personal life prevail. Don't be a secret service Christian running around in a society in fear. Don't live in defeat. 
win the battle for the Lord, by the Lord, through the Lord. Because this morning there is a cause. Are you living for it? Maybe you're here this morning and your cause is yourself. You boil everything down to what you do and how you live and what you're here for and it's all selfish. And maybe it's because today you've never been saved. You can't have the cause of Christ in your life. You can't have His purpose burning in your breast until you know Jesus. You must have the new heart that only He provides. It's something He described as being born again. Jesus, He says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Let me be your Lord Let me be your Savior. Trust me. I'll change you and make you new. And when you trust Christ, He makes you new. And this cause, this purpose begins to burn. You're here today and you're saved. You've had that cause burn in your heart when you were saved. It was all about God's glory, your life. You said, oh, what can I do for this one who did so much for me? And that first love was present and coursing through your veins. But Christian, has your heart been turned aside to lesser things? Have you forgotten the cause? We, the armies of God today, the spiritual army, that's caused to wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You and I, the warrior, are you fighting? Or are you hiding? Are you chasing after lesser things? Maybe you've lost your motivation because you've started chasing those things Saul offered, possessions, position, even just family. Look, nothing can take the place of Christ. Bring back to your heart that simple truth that we sang and that Paul spoke, for to me to live is Christ. Christ. He's our cause. Let's pray. Father, I come to you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I thank you for this searching question asked by David, kept to us to today. Is there not a cause? Lord, trouble our hearts that are lukewarm. Convict and reprove us for living for the wrong causes. May those causes become nothing in our eyes, that the cause of Christ might become everything. Father, may it be true of us, not just in our minds, but burning in our hearts, that to live is Christ. Father, in this invitation, be glorified just in speaking to us and how we respond to you. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.